Egypt is the keeper of secrets, the land of riddles, the birthplace of magic, and the home of the mystery schools. Egypt was known to the ancient world as a repository of high knowledge and magical practices. These universal secrets were contained and kept alive in the mystery schools. The teachings and magical ability they imparted were held in the highest secrecy and reverence. Entrance to the temples that held the secrets was tightly restricted. They were the domain of royalty, priests and privileged initiates. The secret teachings were known as esoteric or occult or symbolist teachings and were held to contain the secrets of the universe and the keys to great magic. The term mystery schools refers not to a specific place or time in ancient Egypt, but the timeless teachings passed down through word of mouth, encrypted into the temples, concealed and enshrined behind a veil of hieroglyphs and symbolism. The temple was not just the location of the teaching, but was itself the teaching. Its hieroglyphics and harmonic proportions contained a catalogue of the occult law. The temple is frozen in time, as is the understanding of the underlying patterns and rules of the universe. The temples are permanent repositories, describing the mysteries and the interconnection between them in that other vast mirror realm our consciousness. The temple is a talisman that needs to be activated by your presence. Today here we're standing alone in the temple of Abu Simba. Incredible situation. We're being affected partially by the symbolism we see, by the harmony of the architecture, but in no way to the degree that an initiate, full initiate would be. In short, we're inside the hardware, but we're not charged with the software that has not been initiated. Whereas, had you been initiated in the fullest sense of Egyptian initiation, temple initiation, then you would have been a software which is programmed to interact with the temple. You wouldn't be here talking to me, you'd be exhorting uh, with the statuaries and the symbolism. You would explode here, intellectually and spiritually. Hieroglyphs, as an expression of high ancient symbolism, are the crossing of language and magic. This very misunderstood technology works with the brain of the initiate to evoke a dense and richly complicated web or matrix of meanings and associations. Hieroglyphs are charged. They are collapsed ideas. In some cases, they can be entire schools collapsed into a single image. To the initiate, to that person who has been given the keys to understanding the many visual and geometric clues. The hieroglyphs are magical talismans, each capable of exploding into a whirlwind of ideas, associations, understandings, lessons. Deep and mysterious arcana. Hieroglyphs are even employed as a repeatable means of rapidly evoking unusual states of consciousness. Symbolism isn't something that is simply told by a teacher to a pupil. Uh, part of it is, but the major uh, labor of understanding a symbol is to experience it. Like computers' use of hierarchy, Hieroglyphs are icons. They are folders, containing as much as we have loaded into the folders through the process of successive initiations. They are magical icons which command and cause a desired brain state. They are programs which perform to the extent that we have installed the upgrades. Like the comparison between a Pentium 1 and a Pentium 4. If you, if you see the analogy, you, you, you start here being totally unprogrammed and you begin slowly to be programmed. And, and the temple becomes more active because you are more receptive. 
until finally you've got a hardware which has the capacity of a, of a Pentium 4 or whatever you call it and you are a program that is perfectly designed to interact with that speed and you discharge your, 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 um, your initiation and the temple discharged and you both interact to produce this, this ultimate result of, 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 of full understanding by simply looking at the objects. The temple becomes like a, like a silent teacher and you are the perfect pupil. The whole idea of statuary, the whole idea of temples, but take statuary as a, as a more obvious example, is not the way we see it as artwork. The, it is artwork in the sense that it is magnificent to guard and pleasing to see, but to them a statue was the, 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 the body, the, 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 the permanent body. They chose materials that would last in order for the talismanic qualities of the principle, be it the king or be it the divinity, to inhabit. Now how did they do this? It, it wasn't a question of hocus pocus of saying I made a statue of the king and therefore the king is in here. They fed it, in a sense, with meaning. The same way we would create meaning in an object. Many people have talisman without being aware of it. You know, a wedding ring, a favorite teddy bear, you know. These are talismans because they are fed with meaning. So the object is not just an object, it is imbued with meaning. So this is how they did it. They fed it with meaning so that when, when an initiate would come into the temple, you would not see the statue. You would see the representation of, of the king with all its qualities, the essence of the, of the, of the principle. The principle may be uh, the stars, may be the, 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 the flood of the Nile, maybe the king, maybe a divinity, maybe an idea. You know, uh, an object, uh, you, you may be wearing a, a ring because it represents your, uh, your fraternity. And, at, uh, at university. But therefore this ring is imbued with the idea that of your membership to this fraternity, all the people who belong to it, the friendships that you made there, the, 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 the experiences that you had. So that ring to you has that meaning. When you see that ring, you see beyond it. That's how they thought. They, they realized correctly that if that the mind responds to this kind of objects, to, to, to talismans. And talismans. Talismans can be anything. Statues, temples, even uh, natural objects, a flower. And think of a flower that is given on the day of you propose to, to your future wife. She takes the flower, she dries it and puts it in a book. Sees the flower 20 years later, bah, she breaks into tears, right? That's the power of imbuing that's how it works. That's how we are made to work. They cleverly understood this and they cleverly combined it with architecture. So architecture becomes the, 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 the material expression of the immaterial force of talisman. Architecture is meant for that. It's not meant to make blocks so we can go and work in offices. Architecture is the... the, the is, they used to call it the... the the royal arts, because it was for, 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 for architecture was for religious purposes. They didn't consider architecture when you build a hut and live there. This is not architecture. What we call architecture is to them the notion of designing a temple was in the hands of those who were initiated to do so. They were, they were, they were priests. They were astronomers. They were those who had studied symbols. They were magicians. And the product of the labor is these temples. 
Illumination is experienced by all who grasp the symbolism presented here.